As you say there, I mean, it, it pretty much put you on, on the map. Yep. And so at Brabham now, you're head of, head of, head of technical director, as we'd say today. Um, did Bernie give you free reign? Uh, on paper, yeah. I, I found myself running a Formula One team with 27, which should have been terrifying if you think about it. Um, but yeah, he gave me completely free reign. Tell me what your kind of ambition was at that point, as far as a perfect Formula One car. I think your ambition when you start in anything like racing is to is to design your own complete Formula One car, which I got the opportunity to do in 72, 73, and then you want to win a race. Uh, and that took until 74. And then of course you want to win a championship. And we won the first championship in 81. Uh, and it goes on from there. But I'm always looking for a new challenge. So by the time I'd won a couple of championships, I was looking for something else to do and thinking about doing, funny enough, a sort of supercar. But then Ron Dennis taught me into coming to McLaren for three years. Uh, so I had another three years of Formula One there. Yeah, but then you did the McLaren F1. Yeah. Well, that was the next challenge. Is you know, after after 20 years from Formula One, what do you do? You try and build the web, the world's best sort of driver's sports car, and that was the F1. Which now people say is the greatest ever high-performance road car, except it's got competition now because. <laughs> because you've built the T50, which has a V12 naturally aspirated Coswell engine. Now, which is that's interesting at a time when we're all being told that we mustn't use fossil fuels. So, what was your thinking? Is this the last hurrah for a great car? Yeah, I mean, our, our, our thinking was there's probably room for one more pure driver's car, and in our opinion, we don't think anybody's really done another F1 that is totally focused on the driving experience, forgetting top speed and 0 to 60 and all that stuff. Um, and lap times, just about the engineering purity in the driving experience. So we thought to celebrate 50 years, there was room for one more normally aspirated car before we all moved to hydrogen or electric. And it turns out that was right because there's enough people out there that still want to enjoy that. Look, um, Seb Vettel's been here this weekend and he's been talking a lot about alternative fuels, synthetic fuels. Um, how realistic is this for the future, a, a synthetic fuel? I think synthetic fuels have a, um, have a future, but uh, at the moment they're very, very costly to produce. So we need to work, it's a bit like hydrogen. Hydrogen is a great, on paper, it has a great future. But at the moment, it takes more oil to make hydrogen than it does to make petrol. So, <laughs> apart from the other problems about storing it under pressure and stuff. Um, so, we're in a bit of a quandary when it comes to future mobility because electric cars, we now understand, aren't the pure answer that we were promised because the energy it takes to make an electric car with its batteries and its inverters and all the rest of it is so damaging to the planet that that isn't a long-term answer either. So we're at a bit of a crossroads, to be honest. And I think instead of the sort of silver bullet that the, the, the badly informed government and legislators seem to be looking for with electric cars won't actually happen, I think we'll end up with a mixture of modes of power source for a much longer time than we think. And part of that will be synthetic fuels. It's true though, isn't it, that petrol is actually the best, most efficient, it, no, I mean, you it's, tell me, I'm not, I'm asking It's you. too good. The power density of petrol is just too good. And of course, you know, the average fuel air ratio is 15 to 1, so you've only got to carry a 15th of your fuel around and the rest of it is all in the air. Whereas, of course, with a battery car, you're carrying 100% round with you, so if you've got a half a ton of batteries, you carry that with you all the time. Would, would buying an electric car be more sensible for, for all of us if we charged it using renewable energy? Because at the moment, we're not, we're not doing that, are we? No, 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 of course, yeah. I mean, it depends entirely on your energy mix. Once, once you've made the car, 
making a car is multiples more damaging than making a petrol car. In this country, with our energy mix, if you took two similar sized motor cars, you know, let's say a Ford Focus, for example, you could build a petrol one and run it for 100,000 kilometers before you equal the damage you do in making the electric one. Well, if that's the case, why, why are governments persuading all of us to buy these things? They're badly informed. You don't say. Okay. That's pretty serious stuff, though. It is. It? I know it is, absolutely, yeah. And it's not an excuse to keep making petrol cars. My point is quite simply, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think we'll have a, we'll have a mixture of modes of power source for some years to come while we figure out exactly the right way to do it. But the real trick is to use this energy to make the car in the first place.